Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Sorry for a bit of a bumpy start. Um, welcome to the EMS Academy. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am a physician, uh, an anesthesia and a critical care physician at Hopkins. I'm an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company and have the honor of serving as one of the assistant medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Je Dr. Jeff Nussbaum and the medical director's office, Chief Nats, EMS office, EMS training academy staff, and Captain Lenny Stewart, Thank you for what you guys do to help our community every day. And thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. Big shout out to Ashley Brooks. Ashley is a young member at Pikesville as well. Ashley, during later on in this training, we'll send a link uh, in the chat, uh, fill out, uh, click on the link, enter some basic information and get your MIM CEUs. We'll also make an announcement towards the end uh, about your CEUs as well. Um, Today, we are super and crazy excited to have with us Matt Goldstein. Uh, Matt is a physician assistant with over 20 years of experience in cardiology and emergency medicine. Matt volunteers as a paramedic in Baltimore and coordinates a Maryland statewide public access AED program. His American Heart Association Training Center, Startbeat LLC, has trained thousands in CPR, first aid, use of the AED, ACLS, and PALS. Matt has been an invited lecturer at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, American Association of Critical Care Nurses, and American Academy of Physician Assistants, as well as many other national groups. He has authored, uh, authored a book, Topics in Electrophysiology, Heart Rhythms, and 12 lead EKG, sold on Amazon, as well as authoring several articles on cardiovascular topics in peer-reviewed journals, and has presented his research at international scientific sessions of the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Cardiology. Matt, I can't begin to thank you enough for being so generous with your time uh, and talent. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Bernholtz, for inviting me back. I guess it wasn't so bad the first time, so uh, I was invited <laughs> back. So uh, tonight we were, uh, the, the goal is to present 12 DKGs and talk about things that might mimic a 12 EDKG. I'm gonna turn off my video because I think you get the idea of what I look like and so you can focus on the screen. So uh, basically, there, in order to talk about what mimics an MI on an EKG, we have to first sort of have the foundation for just a quick and simple way to determine if the person's having a problem on their EKG or not, uh, primarily if they're having a STEMI and then we can start talking further about things that might look like a STEMI and trick us because we really don't want to, every single time we have someone with chest pain, call into the emergency room on the box and say, hey, I think I have a STEMI. After a while, your, your voice is going to be recognized and you're going to be ignored. And so uh, you really want to sort of uh, get a basic idea of what's concerning. And obviously everyone does some overreads on an EKG. How many times have you ever heard someone going to the cath lab and they had a clean calf, right? It happens all the time. They used to say when I was at the hospital, if you don't have uh, enough clean calves, you didn't cath in enough people. And so, uh, yes, it's not a perfect science, but we do want to be able to get a, a good idea of what's a STEMI and what might not be a STEMI. And that's where mimickers really come in to uh, want to sort those things out and not call every single person who has uh, left ventricular hypertrophy a STEMI and every left bundle branch block a STEMI and, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, tonight we're gonna focus part one on recognition of the 12 EDKG, and then we'll focus next time on what mimics the EKG. And we'll sort of talk a little bit about uh, both tonight. Trying to get my slide to move. Let's see how I could do that. Maybe come out of present. Oh, there you go. You got, oh, got it. it going. Okay, so got it. when I think about cardiology, I think about uh, three primary areas: uh, the electrical part, which is when we talk about rhythms, which we're not going to talk about tonight. Then we have the plumbing, which is the coronary artery disease, uh, or I should say coronary arteries that sort of feed the heart. And then we have the mechanical, which are, is the pump, like when we talk about things like heart failure. So tonight we're gonna focus on the plumbing of the heart, the coronary arteries. So first I wanna sort of establish what we're, what we're looking at when we look at a 12 EKG. 
So I think about you have a ball in the center of the heart. So the center core of the heart has a ball and you're staring from outside of that person's body at that ball, which is the center core of the person's heart. And when you stare at that ball, that's the center core of the heart, you're seeing what is going on in between you and that center core. Now, when I say me, I'm really thinking about an electrode stuck on the person's chest and I'm seeing what it is looking at as it stares through that person at the center core of the heart. But what do we really care about? When we do a 1280 kg, we're really not trying to look at the lungs or how much hair the person has on their body. We want to see how electricity passes through the person's heart muscle. So that's what we care about when we do a 1280 kg. And then what makes electricity flow through the heart muscle normally? Well, you have to have healthy heart muscle. And what keeps healthy heart muscle or what keeps heart muscle healthy? You have to have oxygenated blood flow going through to that heart muscle. And what makes oxygenated blood go through to the heart muscle? You have to have patent coronary vessels. So when we say, oh, I'm doing a 12 kg to see what their coronary vessels show, that's a pretty distant stretch that the 12 kg is actually looking at what the coronary arteries are doing even though that's what we care about when we do a 12 kg And so then you can understand why it's confusing when you do a 12 kg And that's because there are a whole lot of other structures besides myocardium that's in between you as that electrode plastered on the chest and that center core of the heart. So for example, you have ribs, you have skin, you have hair, you have pericardium, you have myocardium. So you have all this other stuff and spaces that is in between you and that center core or the electro that center core of the heart. And then even if everything's pretty straightforward in between those two areas, then there are other factors that even alter the myocardium. That's what you're looking at. So you could have hypertrophy, you could have electrolyte imbalances, you could have certain medications that have effect on the muscle. And so there's a whole lot of factors that play into the 12 lead EKG other than just, oh, this person has a coronary artery that might be diseased or not. So that's why this really gets confusing. So why, is, why are 12 lead EKGs important? Because obviously, and I'm, you know, kind of we all know this, that time is muscle, right? And so we do that 12 lead EKG in the field so that we could tell the hospital. I think I have a STEMI and they could alert the, they could alert the team in the cath lab. That's number one. Number two is for you, you wanna make sure you go to the appropriate hospital if you think that they're having a, a coronary type of event. Uh, number three, there are certain times that you don't wanna give medications for certain things you might see. And so the 12 kg is really important, but we really uh, put an emphasis on time because we know that myocardium doesn't regenerate itself. And so when it's dead, it's dead generally. And weak myocardium results in heart failure. Weak myocardium is proarrhythmic. So people end up with implanted defibrillators or they end up having ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation arrests. And so it's, it's a bad idea to let someone let that MI stew. And so, that's why there's such a focus nowadays on getting people to the cath lab and identifying the correct patients early on and alerting the hospital. So just note to self, uh, 1280 kg, it's a nice screening tool, right? How many times have you had a patient who tells you, uh, you know, if the EKG is okay, I'm just gonna stay home, right? Because they, they think that the, the end all is the, is the EKG. And again, EKG is a screening tool. And so, uh, if the person's having a large event that's been going on for a considerable amount of time, yeah, I would expect the EKG to be significantly abnormal. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to have a large event pop up on the EKG uh, a short time later. And I'll show you a, a case a little bit later like that. So we're going to do early detection with an EKG, hopefully, of what I'm going to call myocardial insult. So non-medical uh, non term, we're going to call collectively problems with the myocardium because the person has cardiovascular disease, we're gonna call it a myocardial insult. And I'll show you what I'm talking about shortly.
So I, I kind of like this slide because it really shows how this evolved over the last 110 or so years. Uh, in 1912, you can see what the EKG looked like. Uh, took up an entire room. That little gooey electrode that you stick on the person uh, is taking the place of an entire bucket of water. And so the bucket of water has been uh, reduced, but basically the person put their their arms and their feet in a bucket, and that's sort of how the uh, that's how the electricity was conducted to that very large machine. And now they have little handheld twelve lead uh, EKGs. And now people, you know, they might be don't, not be doing a twelve lead, but people are getting their rhythms on on smartwatches. So it's kind of uh, evolved uh, most of it during our lifetimes. So. Uh, proper lead placement. So the purpose of this is not to school people on where to put the leads. You can have a little card by your by your monitor. Uh, but the idea is that it's really important to have uh, consistent lead placement. So you really want to be able to compare apples to apples. So when you do a 12 lead and then you get to the triage area in the ER and they do a 12 lead or you do a 12 lead in their in the person's house and then you do a 12 lead outside and then you do a 12 lead uh, they do a 12 lead in triage and the ER does a 12 lead again and they send the person to the cath lab and they do 12 lead and then the person ends up on the medical floor if they're admitted you end up having all these different 12 leads you want to be able to compare them to see are there things that are changing uh, or not and that's why lead placement is important so just on the side you can you can do a quick google and you can see how you know, where lead placements uh, where proper lead placement uh, is and you could kind of print it or keep that next to your 12 lead device. So what we're looking at when we do a 12 lead EKG is we're seeing how the electricity flows through the person's myocardium. So we just have to understand a little bit about anatomy to know we, what is feeding those areas that the, the electricity is going through that myocardium, what feeds that myocardium with the oxygenated blood. And so if we look at the, at the person's heart anatomy, so we have this right coronary artery, you have this, we'll just generically call it an inferior branch of the coronary artery that feeds the, the right coronary artery that feeds sort of the bottom of the heart, the inferior part. You have the left coronary artery, the left main, and that splits into the LED, the left anterior descending, and you have the circumflex that comes around the side and comes down like so. And so you have this right coronary artery actually then loops around to the back of the heart. So to the posterior part, and then you have this inferior branch. And I put these little uh, kind of markers showing you what each of the areas of the 12 lead is looking at. So. The inferior area of the heart is looked at by 2, 3, and AVF. The septum area is V1 and V2, and extending out to V3 and V4, uh, which is sort of collectively the anterior area of the heart. And then V5, V6 is looking at the lower lateral wall, and 1 AVL is the high lateral wall. And so that's sort of the anatomy of the person's heart. So as I was mentioning to you, the right coronary artery has a branch that feeds the inferior area, but then if we look over here, it also wraps around to the posterior part of the heart. So it has a whole lot of distribution. You have the left coronary artery, which bifurcates into the LED and the circumflex. So here's the anterior view and here's the posterior view. So here's a look at the person's heart in animation. So here you have, again, we'll have to do it fast, but you have this right coronary artery, that inferior branch, the left coronary artery, the LAD, and the circumflex. And here's where the right coronary artery feeds around to the posterior part of the heart. And obviously, there's small vessels that continue to break off from there. Um, I just put sort of the the main vessels, but you can see how it's very territorial. Each of these vessels feeds a significant area of the person's heart. And so kind of talking about anatomy a little bit further, 
So this area we call the inferior part of the heart, and this area we call the septum, and this area we call the anterior, and here we call the lateral, and that's the high lateral wall and the low lateral wall. Then, of course, we have the posterior part of the heart. Now, here is a cartoon of a 12 lead EKG. And really what you should be doing when you do a 12 lead EKG is you should be seeing this picture. You should be seeing this picture in your head when you look at this. So when you see an EKG and you're looking at 2, 3, and EVF, your brain is thinking, this is the area I'm looking at. And then your brain should be thinking, and that's a branch, that's the inferior area, which is a branch of the RCA that feeds the inferior area. And then when we look at this area, we're thinking, okay, that's the septum. This area, that's the anterior. And these are pretty much collectively fed on generally by the LAD. And then we start getting into the high lateral wall. And we're thinking, okay, the circumflex. And then we're looking at the low lateral wall. And the low lateral wall is really a mixed bag. You could actually have someone with a long branch, so to speak, of the RCA, which wraps up to the bottom there. You could have someone with an LAD that feeds down here, or you could have someone who has a long circumflex that feeds down there. So this area here should be actually fed by different distribution based on different people's anatomy, which could be a good thing for that person. So here is that cartoon on an actual 12 lead. And then what I do when I look at a 12 lead EKG is I might not draw this on the EKG, but this is what I'm thinking. So as soon as I got a 12 lead EKG, I sort of bust it up into neighborhoods in my head. And I always look at the inferior area first. Then I look at the high lateral wall. Then I look at the septum. Then I look at the anterior. And then I look at the low lateral wall. So what are we looking at in these areas? So I'm looking, when I think about a STEMI or an ST segment elevation MI, I'm looking at the ST segment, right? And so the ST segment is the first area after the end of the QRS complex between there and the T wave. So that's the ST segment. And we're looking at things like ST segment elevation. And so once that pulls up, then you start getting a different appearance than we had before, right? So you kind of lose that nice look at the T wave and we start getting ST segment elevation and it sort of starts to draw in the QRS complex to the T wave. Okay, so this is where I was talking about that term I use called an, in, an insult. So what we're looking at on a 12 EDKG is we're looking for concerning things. We're looking for ischemia, injury, or infarction. So ischemia are things like ST segment depression. So if I look at my isoelectric line and always mark, mark, uh, look at an isoelectric line from before the P wave to before the P wave. So if I look at from before the P wave to before the P wave, I strike my isoelectric line. I can see how the ST segment is depressed here. It's pulled down. T wave inversion, right? Flip T waves or a flat T wave. That's indicative that the person has ischemia. And then we have injury. Injury is ST segment elevation. So we can see I strike my isoelectric line and this is ST segment is elevated. It's upward. Now, infarction is when you have Q waves. Now, a Q wave is when the very first movement, so to speak, of the QRS complex is downward. That's a Q wave. So now you're wondering, why am I calling it an acute myocardial infarction if it takes sometimes 24 hours to develop a Q wave? And that's why I would suggest, and if, if you look at a 12 EDKG that's formally read, you'll see it'll say uh, bleep, 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 acute MI, bleep, bleep, bleep. And then it'll say underneath uh, acute injury pattern seen on or before whatever date or time. And so really these terms are sort of used, even though the person's having a, what they call an MI, they're really having an acute injury. 
So I just collectively say, are they having an MI, meaning injury infarction, or are they having ischemia? And the reason why I say that is because look at this person right here who's having an infarction. Do I know if this person had an MI two years ago and now they've re-stenosed and now they're having another acute MI? Or if they had an MI that started last night and now it's a big MI that they're already queuing in, I don't know. So I don't know really what this means other than at some point in this person's life, whether it be today or whether it be two years ago, this person has been having or have a significant MI, but that's sort of like irrelevant to me, right? So just collectively put this together and don't try to uh, figure out timing and just say, are they having an MI? and collectively put those together. But just keep in mind, it does take some time to make a Q wave, but you don't know if this is acute on, on chronic look, so to speak. So what's the challenge? So here's the challenge. The challenge is that for every single thing I just told you, ST segment elevation, ST segment depression, and inverted T waves, et cetera, there's 20 things that could cause each of those things to happen. So. The real question is, how do you figure out what's the real deal and how do you figure out what's not? And so, you know, I, I, back in the day before we were a sophisticated profession, you know, you'd hear paramedics say, well, you know, I'm bringing plasma anyhow, so I'll, I'll let it be their thing, right? I'll just, I'll just, you know, we, we couldn't transmit. So you would just get on the radio and you would just tell them uh, it could be an MI, you know, and, and that would be that. Um, but but we're a sophisticated profession now, and we can really have a lot of good by activating the cath lab appropriately. Um, and again, think about the resources on the hospital side. When you say you have an MI or you say you have a stroke, they they kind of got all hands on deck to take care of that patient. Now imagine if every single unit that was coming in was saying that. Well, that would deplete the resources, and they wouldn't be able to service uh, basically anybody and it would, it would all fall apart and our patients wouldn't get the help they need. But if we look at ST segment elevation, you can have left ventricular hypertrophy. You have ST segment elevation, it could be from pericarditis, myocarditis, early repolarization, hypothermia, right? Just a whole host of things that could cause someone to have the same EKG abnormalities that you have with ischemia injury infarction. And so what we really have to do is start figuring out who's the real deal, who's the STEMI, who's something else. And so let's start with a few, a few rules. So rule number one is we wanna know what might be global and what might be focal. So generally an MI, an acute MI is caused by a single culprit lesion. Yes, if someone, in other words, it's bad, you're having a bad enough day when you have a single LA lead, L, LAD lesion blast, right? And when that, when that LAD lesion blasts, it, you know, the, the platelets come and they aggregate in that area, try to heal you and the mind of the platelets, occlude the vessel, and you're having a bad day. Why would that happen on the right side of the heart, the left side of the heart, the circumflex area, the lateral part of the heart, all at the same time? Now, if you're having a, a good cocaine party, that, that could happen, right? Or if this has been going on for a long time and you sort of poop out your entire heart, uh, yes, that could happen. But in general, when someone starts having chest pain and they end up calling and you show up, it's because they have a single culprit lesion creating the issue. And a single culprit lesion gives what we call a focal distribution to the concern. So in other words, you would not expect if I have an LED lesion that everywhere on IEKG, I have ST segment elevation. That would be a global problem. So on the same, I'm not saying your EKG looks normal everywhere. I'm just saying the same problem all over the place is not usually indicative of a single culprit lesion. Usually a single culprit lesion causes a focal problem and not a global problem. And I'll show you shortly what I'm talking about. So uh, when I when I used to do these classes and I, I worked off of clickers, I had these uh, examples and everyone would kind of vote and uh, the clicker sort of got a little obsolete. Uh, so I have, I have some examples. Uh, we're not in a classroom to have people raise their hand and all that, but we'll just ask the question and then 
we'll give you a second to think and we'll and then we'll we'll answer it. So what area of the heart is AVF looking at? The area that I circled. So if I do a 1280 kg and my eyes look at AVF and I see an abnormality, what area of the heart am I looking at? With a little bit of time, they do put in the chat as well. Oh, okay. They just need a little warm up typically, but then they get into it. Okay, cool. So here, I'll make a multiple choice then. So I don't see the chat, but looking so at the chat, no one's chatting. Here we go. Okay. Inferior. Okay. Let's see how we did. Excellent. All right. Good job. So we're on a roll. How about this area? And we'll open up to multiple choice. Somebody said inferior. Oh, that's probably from the last one. Never mind. Okay. Lateral. Okay, good. So that's the high lateral wall. I agree. How about this area? You have a choice of multiple choice? Oh, I'm sorry. Anterior. Somebody's chiming in. Okay, so I think I think of anterior as more V3 and V4 and sort of V3 lateral. V3 and V4. So good. I'm going to go with lateral too. I agree with you. And one more, I think, for this section. Septal. Excellent. Okay, good. Uh, okay, one more, one more. Anterior. Excellent. Okay, and what's that area? So you can see how it's fed, fed by the LED. Anterior. Perfect. Posterior. Sounds good to me. And then what vessel is that? LAD. Perfect. And that one? RCA. Great. And one more. Circumflex. Excellent. OK, perfect. So we kind of got our anatomy down. So we'll go into the next talk, which is talking about how to pick up on a STEMI. So the, the kind of concept that we came up with was that it's all in the waves of the EKG. So what are we talking about? So we're still talking about plumbing. And we're going to talk about waveform morphology, so the shape of the waves. So EKG interpretation is all in the waves, and it's similar to the waves, things that you would see at a beach. So I'm from Long Beach, California. So I'm very into uh, growing up by the beach. Uh, some of you may not be as familiar with the beach, but I want you to look at these pictures and I want you to sort of think which one of these things you probably don't see at the beach. Now, you might see it near the beach, but you don't see one of these things at the beach. So I'll make it multiple choice again. So we got a water slide, a surfer, a hammock, a beach ball, a lifeguard chair and sharks. So which one of those things, like if you watch Sesame Street, what does it say? One of these things is not like the other. So which of these things you might not see at the beach, you might see associated with the theme of a beach, but you might not see it like when you're sitting out on the sand at the beach. So you want, does anyone want to take a so there are a lot of hammocks, 
a guest and one person picked water slide. I will, I'm going to go with the water slide because you know you could you could hook a hammock up by the beach. You, you don't need two trees to make a hammock. You can have some kind of a hammock chair type thing. But a water slide, I I I agree with because the water slide is something that you generally don't have at the beach. Now, if you go to Ocean City and you're walking down the boardwalk, you see on one side of your eyes you see water slides by the you see them by the hotels, by their pools, but you don't see the water slide like on the beach landing you with your behind in the sand, right? So when you're in Ocean City, the Ocean City is really the perfect example to think of this because you have, you could have a water slide up in the, uh, up in a hotel in Owings Mills where you have no beach anywhere nearby, or you can have a water slide sort of associated with the beach at Ocean City. So you have the things that are sort of similar or, or something that would be familiar to you at on the beach side. And then you have the water slide that might be familiar with you pulling together the whole theme of going to Ocean City, but it's not really a on the beach type of thing. So that's where we're going. That's where we're kind of going with this with this idea. So you could have a hammock, right? All right. So a hammock. So mind you, you have to have SC segment elevation. Once you have the SC segment elevation, then you could have SC segment elevation that looks like a hammock. So you could have a person sort of resting in the hammock. You could have SC segment elevation that looks like a surfer, a surfboard. Okay, again, mind you, you have to have SC segment elevation, and then it looks like a surfboard. It sort of goes straight up from there. You could have a lifeguard chair. So sort of a look of a lifeguard chair. And so, again, you have SC segment elevation, and then you have a lifeguard chair. You could have it rounded like a beach ball. But then you could have an SC segment that looks like a water slide. And the water slide alone, you might be in Owings Mills in your friend's backyard. So the way it works is in order for you to tie that water slide into a beach, you have to have other beachly things at the beach together in your EKG. So if your EKG only has water slides as your SC segment elevation, I would suggest that it's not a STEMI. It's something else. Generally, I'm not going to say always because always gets you in trouble, but 99.9% .9 of the time, you have some other morphology associated with the beach that pulls your water slide into that view of you walking down the boardwalk in Ocean City that turns that water slide into a beach theme and makes it an MI. So that is kind of the concept we're looking at. Now, there's one more thing you might see at the beach. You might see a shark. Now, we rarely see sharks at the beach, right? I mean, I guess some people go shark fishing off the pier, but generally you don't see big sharks at the beach, right? If you did, you probably wouldn't be going to the beach. But if you do see a shark at the beach, if you see a shark fin, it's rare, but deadly. And so when we see an EKG that has a shark fin like that, that person is having the big one and they got to get somewhere really, really fast because they're not going to have a good day because shark fin EKGs could be deadly. But the other themes from the beach, again, we're going to use them, that morphology to be concerned about. We're going to, we're going to add in a few more things, but where I see most of the people over read EKGs are water slides. So how many times have you brought a patient into the emergency room and you were all, you know, thought they were having the big one and 
they kind of glanced at it while walking past you and didn't make you feel very good about yourself, right? And or, or mumbled early repolarization or something like that. Because usually a, a isolated water slide is not a STEMI. Okay, so what do we think that is? It's open to interpretation. As long as no one types in water slide, then, we, <laughs> then we're good. Um, some people say, you know, a hammock. Now, if, if you think that's a water slide, that's going to hurt going down, right? That little prong there, that's not going to feel good. So I'm not going to give that a water slide. So that's that's a hammock. Or a surfboard. I, I would I would probably call it a hammock looking at it right now. What do we think that is? Now, water slides, think about a slide. A slide does not hump this direction, right? A slide sort of goes like that and then down. So you wouldn't have a slide that's sort of rounded, I guess they call it concave. It's, it's not gonna look like that. So I'm gonna say beach ball for that one. What do we think about that one? Again, you don't have water slides that look like that, and you definitely don't have a prong sticking up at the end. So I'll probably call that a surfboard. And again, that rounded look, I'm gonna call that a beach ball. So again, the idea is sort of to look at these different morphologies and sort of think in our mind, the concept of the beach. And I'll show you a slide a little bit later uh, where you know people give other terms to things like a fireman's helmet or uh, a tombstone, but the problem is they they miss a whole bunch of other morphologies. I think that the beach theme really uh, captures all the different possibilities. So this one I'm going to call a hammock. Hey Matt. Yes. Yeah. So these are I I have always loved this framework. I think it's super helpful. Um, the majority of people I would say are getting them totally right in terms of kind of what compared to what you're saying, but there are definitely some who are not. So I just want to pause for one second and just to see from anyone, is there anything in particular that you want to see again or to clarify? I know sometimes it goes a bit fast if, if this is the first time you've done it, um, but I do want to just pause. So Rodney says, yes, Rodney, which one in particular are you struggling with? Anything in particular? Or do you just want to see all of them? You'd like to see the EKG. Sorry, I didn't feel like typing the whole thing. Um, um, I just want to see the EKG with the um, um, the LED, uh, one, two, three, like with this screen right here that has the EKG. You I want to see the. No, it was like twenty slides ago. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Back here, Rodney? Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. The, that one right here. This one? Okay. Yes. All right, I'm good. Okay, perfect. Anyone else with any of the... Um morphologies that you want to see again or to clarify? Nothing else in the chat. Thanks, Matt. Okay, perfect. So let's see, let me just get my pointer back. All right, so here's a, there are a few rules. What happens in one neighborhood stays in that neighborhood generally. Or if there are more than two leads in a neighborhood and at least two leads when there are three. So in other words, think about you're, you're in a building. 
So you go to Towson Town Center and you go out the front of the building and it's raining. You wouldn't be normal if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go around the back because it's not going to be raining. Because when it's raining at Towson Town Center, it's raining at Towson Town Center. Now, if you're going to meet your friend in Glen Burnie and you forgot your raincoat when you're at Towson Town Center, you're you're not going to go to your back to your house in Middle River to pick up your raincoat because there's a probability that it might not be raining in Glen Burnie. And so even though you could have a large storm that sort of touches neighborhoods that are next to your neighborhood, generally what happens in your neighborhood, it's happening in your neighborhood and you know other neighborhoods probably have something different going on over there. And so when we see a neighborhood, so like if you look at the inferior area, like we talked about 2-3 and AVF, you would expect at least two leads to have a problem. If you have a low lateral wall problem, you would expect V5 and V6. We don't expect to see SC segment elevation in one lead because that would mean that the problem's not including the neighborhood. And the next concept that we're gonna talk about is the idea of reciprocal changes. Now you don't have to have reciprocal changes, you usually do. But what the concept of reciprocal changes is going to help us is to decide is something global or is something focal. So in other words, if the same problem is going on in my entire EKG, then I wouldn't have an opposite. Reciprocal change means you see an opposite appearance going in opposite area. So if you have the entire EKG shows the same thing, then you don't have a reciprocal change and your problem is, is global. But if you have another appearance going on somewhere else, then your problem could be focal. So basically when I look at the EKG, I'm gonna look and I'm gonna to try to determine is the problem global or focal? Because remember I showed you, for example, uh, I showed you that someone could have uh, SC segment depression when they have hypothermia. Now, do you have hypothermia of the right side of the heart and not your left side of the heart? No, your body's cold and the whole heart's cold. So you would, so if the whole heart's cold, you see a problem going on in the whole heart. Uh, digoxin, for example, is a medication that sometimes alters the view of the electricity on the 12 EKG. But you don't have digoxin selectively filtering down your RCA and not going down your out your 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 left main, and so you would see the sort of the the condition or the problem in the whole EKG. Uh, if the person has hyper hypokalemia, you wouldn't expect the problem to be in one specific area. So therefore, you wouldn't expect to see reciprocal changes. But if someone has a coronary artery that's blocked, that's affecting one area, then you would expect to see an opposite problem going off in an opposite area. And that would sort of confirm to you that the problem is focal and not global. And I'll, I'll show you shortly examples. So what I mean again by reciprocal changes is sort of an opposite appearance going on in a different distribution of a different blood vessel. So for example, 2, 3, and AVF would be opposite here. It doesn't have to be so extreme, right? You could have one AVL could be opposite what's over here. But you have an opposite air, an, an, another blood vessel to make it easier, another blood vessel that is showing an opposite problem than what you're seeing in your area of concern. So for example, if I see an MI here, Maybe I'll see something as subtle as ischemia here. And that would sort of be reciprocal. Was it open stuff or it's out? It's all closed stuff. Yeah, I'll take it. And then we can put it in the middle. Yeah, I want to get it. Yeah, do it or whatever. I don't know if someone hit. I don't know. All right, can you hear me again?
Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So, for example, oh, so so one more rule we have here. You will hear the term non-specific EKG changes used for a host of different things. If things sort of don't add up entirely, people say, oh, it's a non-specific change. But you also hear the term non-specific EKG changes when you talk about V1 and lead three, it's very normal for them to look ischemic. In other words, when you have, sometimes even AVF gets pulled into it a little bit, but if you see S, a flip T wave, sort of this ischemic appearance in three, and this ischemic appearance in V1, totally normal. Uh, those are non-specific changes. Okay. So now we sort of built the foundation and now we could approach how we're going to interpret a 12 at EKG. And it's these very easy steps. And so we're gonna look at seven of the steps tonight. And then next time we're gonna focus on sort of what I call the final hug of the EKG. We wanna know, okay, now we think there's a problem, but is there something there that's sort of tricking me that mimics an MI and they're not really having an MI. So for tonight, we're gonna cover the first, almost the whole thing. And then we'll put a lot of focus next time on things that mimic an MI. So the first thing we always ask ourselves is what's the rhythm, right? What's the rhythm? Because if the person is in complete heart block and they keep having syncopal episodes and they have almost no blood pressure, it's not get a 12 EKG time, right? Or if I have a 12 EKG, we're not going to sit there and start, okay, well, you know, while they kind of go out on you, be like, well, okay, well, I'm going to break into neighborhoods and do I see ischemia injury infarction as a global or as a focal or reciprocal changes for my theory and anatomical? Does this make sense? By the time you're done, then you don't have a patient anymore. So, first thing we do is to say, is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? So, again, if someone has a, a heart rate of 180, we're probably focusing on the heart rate of 180, whether it be SVT, whether it be VTAC, and we're not sitting here breaking them into neighborhoods. So we ask ourselves, the rhythm okay is the rate okay? And again, you know, we don't you don't have to sit there with calipers and figure out exactly to the to the T what the rhythm is or what it could be and the rate. We just want to know is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? And then we're going to break into neighborhoods, like I showed you before, the like that slide we just popped up again. We're going to break into neighborhoods, the inferior area, and I'll show you this again in a minute, the inferior area, the high lateral wall, the low lateral wall, the septum, the anterior. And then within each of these neighborhoods, we want to know, is there any evidence of an insult, ischemia or infarct or, or MI, we'll call it. Then we want to know, is it global or focal? Because again, we said if it's global, it's probably something else. If it's focal, it's probably a blood vessel problem. Are the reciprocal changes to support my theory that this is focal and not global? And then we want to ask ourselves, does this make sense anatomically? So we, we, already, we already mastered the anatomy of the heart. Can I stick a lesion somewhere? Can I make this person have a coronary artery that's occluded somewhere that would then make that appearance on the EKG? And then we're on to something, but Next time we're gonna talk about the final hug. Is there something that mimics an MI? And then we'll stay true to our, then we'll be able to stay true to whatever uh, opinion we came up with for that 12 with EKG. So again, we start off, what's the rhythm, what's the rate? So in other words, I get this EKG. I, I, I'm not breaking this person into neighborhoods, right? So this happened to be this person was in the middle of a stress test and they, they went to VTAC. So we were able to get a perfect EKG of someone in VTAC. But the key thing is, is that this person has a problem, right? I got to deal with their problem. I'm not neighborhooding them. I'm not starting to look for other stuff. They got enough problems without that. And then I want to break into neighborhoods, right? So that's that slide we looked at before. Then when I break into neighborhoods, I want to know, okay, inferior, high lateral wall, septum, anterior, and low lateral wall. And I'm gonna, what I, what I do is I tell people, don't let your eyes do the walking. In other words, don't let your eyes just jump to where you think the problem is because then you miss stuff. 
you look at every single EKG the same way. So I don't care what approach you take as far as where you want to start. I always start inferiorly. I say, okay, inferiorly, what do I have? Do I have any ST segment elevation, ST segment depression? Or do I have an insult? And what might that insult be? Is it MI versus ischemia? Then I look at high lateral wall, one in AVL. Do I have any insult there? Then I look at the septum. And then I look at the anterior, V3 and V4. And, you know, on the general person's anatomy, sort of V1, you don't see a whole lot going on. And V2, V3, V4 are sort of like lumped together. Um, they have to have sort of specialized anatomy to separate out their septum from their anterior. So you can collectively kind of put those together in general and say, you know, okay, that's the LED distribution. And then you have the V5, V6, the low lateral wall, which could be together with the high lateral wall that might not be together with the high lateral wall because it might be together with the anterior, it might be together with the inferior, or it could be together with the high lateral wall, depending on how the person's anatomy looks. And we'll understand that a little bit further soon. And then I wanna know, is there any evidence of an insult in those areas, right? Do I see ST segment elevation? And I wanna know, do I have any ischemia, injury, infarction? I wanna know, do those findings look like a beach or do they look like a water slide? Or do I have a combination of both if I have water slides and I'm getting concerned about the shape and the look of what I see? Then I wanna know, does the problem appear global? And meaning, do I have the same problem everywhere? Or do I have that problem that I, that I have in a specific area? a specific neighborhood. And again, do I have that problem going on within the whole neighborhood or at least two out of three in that neighborhood? Or is it just one area of that neighborhood, which really wouldn't even be focal for an MI? And then I wanna know other reciprocal changes to support my theory. So here's an example when I say, is it global or focal? And people look at this right away and they're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's global. Well globally, the EKG looks very concerning, right? But I do have a different look inferiorly. See how this is an ischemic appearance inferiorly, and the rest is more of a MI type of appearance. And so it's really not global. It's really focal, even though you're sort of looking at it and, you, and, and right off the bat, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, this isn't, oh my gosh. And yes, this person hopefully is at the cath lab sooner than later, but the problem is sort of, it's focal as opposed to global because I don't see ST segment elevation everywhere. And then I wanna know are the reciprocal changes to support my theory, which I just showed you reciprocal changes right here, right? This is reciprocal to here. So do I have reciprocal changes, an opposite problem going in opposite area? And, and I did, right? And then here's the big question. Now you got to think back to everything you did and say, is an anatomically, can this make sense? Can this happen anatomically? So that's where you have to say, okay, if I would have an occlusion right here, that would make the person have ST segment elevation in two, three, and AVF. You're like, oh, okay, well, that's where I have ST segment elevation. So that makes sense. But if I have ST segment elevation in lead two and lead one and V3, and that doesn't make sense anatomically because lead two would be this blood vessel and, and lead one would be this blood vessel and V3 would be this blood vessel. So that doesn't make any sense anatomically. There's no culprit lesion that I could have that would make that happen. And even if they were doing cocaine or this MI has been going on for two days, that they wouldn't be like that. Those whole areas, if all three areas were now knocked out, all the all the area would be knocked out. So I would I would end up having 
together with lead one, I would have, let's say, AVL. And together with lead two, I would have three and AVF. And together with V3, I probably have V4, maybe even V2. So that's what I mean by, does this make sense anatomically? And then there's the things that mimic an MI that we're going to look at next time we get together and how we pick up on left bundle branch blocks and how we pick up on left ventricular hypertrophy and how we pick up on ventricular pacemakers. And the most, the most difficult one is aberrant type of arrhythmias, especially when someone gets tacky in general, it gets really hard to figure out, especially when they have tachycardia and they have a history of a bundle branch block or a history of LVH, all that. So those are the most complex ones, um, early repolarization, pericarditis, and artifacts. And so um, those are the things I sort of call the mimickers of an MI. And again, you know, it's not a perfect science. And it's okay if you go on a lot of calls and one out of 10, you do an overread. But you just don't want to be that person that every single time they hear your voice that you know, sort, sort of, you go to the same hospital every time and it, that you totally miss the ball. And then we'll also talk about things like, like certain medications, like from the protocols that you wouldn't want to give the person uh, when you do a 12 kg. And if there's any, if there are any EMTs on, uh, there's, there's sort of, I have a feeling that if you're going to, if you're going to do an EKG and you're going to transmit it, well, you have to have a basic knowledge of, of what you're looking at in case something goes wrong with the transmission. Uh, that way, you know to call for someone to rendezvous with you or tell the ER you're bringing in a priority one patient. Uh, you you got to really have a, a general idea of what you're looking at. So it's kind of important for everybody to have an idea. So let's go ahead and apply the rules to each of those areas. And we'll see how, how far we get tonight. So again, what's the rhythm? What's the rate? We break into neighborhoods. Is there any evidence of an insult? Does the problem appear global or focal? Are the reciprocal changes to support my theory? And does it make sense anatomically? So here we go. So I sort of give it away, but let's talk through each of these. So I get this 12 ADKG. And the first thing I do is I say, okay, is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? And so, yeah, it looks fine to me, right? So, you know, maybe the person's a little bit slow, whatever, but it's not something that I have to focus on the rate. It's something I have to focus on the rest of the EKG. So rhythm's okay, rate's okay. And then I'm going to break it into neighborhoods. And I always say start inferiorly. And if we look inferiorly, we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, is there any evidence of an insult? And I see clearly if there's SC segment elevation, in lead three and AVF, which is two out of three in this area of distribution. So it raises concern. And I'm just noting to self that it doesn't look like a water slide because there's a prong there. So it's definitely in its own right concerning what I see right here inferiorly. And then I move on to the next area and I say high lateral wall. In the high lateral wall, I say, oh, I have evidence of ischemia. So if you're more, you know, if you do this more often, more than, than, than others, you might automatically have connected, okay, I have a problem, reciprocal changes, but let's just leave that aside. I said ischemic appearance, high lateral wall. And then I'm gonna say, okay, septum. In the septal area, I have ischemia. You can argue that that looks a little ischemic there too. But you know, just, just so you know, generally, there's not a whole lot that you see above the line, so to speak, in V1. And then anteriorly, I see looks okay. And low lateral wall, maybe a little drop of ischemia. And so then I say to myself, do I have a problem? And I say, yes, I think I have a problem inferiorly. I say, is it global or focal? And I think it's focal. Do I reciprocal changes to support that theory? Yes. And anatomically, could this happen? And sure, 
if I have a lesion in the RCA, I have a problem. And so this person has an inferior MI. Now, I meant to switch the slide out because there actually is also evidence of a posterior MI. We're going to get to that shortly. But just pretend you didn't see this. Uh, I'm going to sw I'm going to swap this EKG out. I totally meant to do that today and forgot uh, because that could confuse people. But definitely the person's having an inferior MI. Ignore this for our purposes right now. If you picked up on the posterior, then that's that's amazing. I'll show you another example of the same shortly. And so this person has a lesion, and you can see here, if you can see on your screen, that this area of myocardium is dying, it's getting necrotic, because I have a lesion here that's causing that view on the EKG. So it's sort of, it all makes sense. It's a puzzle. The whole puzzle came together for me. If the puzzle is not coming together for you, then it might not be a STEMI, or it's, it's not a STEMI if the puzzle is not coming together for you, as long as you apply these rules and you have the basic foundation. Now, here's another one. And I'll tell you, the all these EKGs that I'm showing you, uh, the, these particular ones that look have this look to it are not from the field. Uh, when I worked at Franklin Square's ER from 97 on, they were doing the studies uh, for with uh, fibromyalgia therapy uh, for MIs. And basically, we had a book where anytime someone has STEMI, they would write the patient's social security number in there. You couldn't do that nowadays, right? They would have this notebook by the, by the printer, and it would have every single person who had a STEMI. So then I would come in on my Saturday night shift and I would print out every single STEMI and I would scan it, which gave me just a fantastic library of every possible STEMI from the Essex Dundalk region, which is basically any kind of STEMI that you could ever have on every single shift. So um, these are really good. These are really uh, good EKGs to look at. And they're really crisp and clear. Um, so we look at this EKG and I say, okay, is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? And I know some of you are saying, well, it's a little slow, but again, slow is okay. You know, it's not a rate of 30. It's some, you know, they're, they're, I don't need to address the rate right now. And so then I break into neighborhoods and I say, okay, inferiorly, do I have any concerns? And I say, sure, I have some ST segment depression and some T wave inversion. So I have some ischemia appearance in two out of the three leads. And then I look at the high lateral wall. And if you look closely, you see ST segment elevation like a hammock. Okay, it's, it's, it's not that common that you see a pure lateral uh, MI EKG. And this was the best example I got out of the entire book. And so out of the entire library. And then I say, okay, high I'm sorry. Then I say, so high lateral wall, I'm concerned. And then I say, septal, septum looks okay. Anterior, you might argue, it looks a little bit yanked down like some ischemia. And the low lateral wall, maybe it looks like a hint of ST segment elevation. And so I say, okay, do I think I have a problem? I certainly think I have a problem here, high lateral wall and maybe maybe low lateral wall. And then I say to myself, okay, is it global or focal? And if I had, I didn't say I had the same problem everywhere. So it's clearly focal. Do I have reciprocal changes to support my theory? And I said I had ischemia somewhere, which happened to be over here, which is opposite there right? Because it's a, a different blood vessels distribution. And then I say to myself, can this happen? Can I have a culprit lesion that could anatomically make this happen? And the answer is sure. I have a circumflex lesion and this person's circumflex sort of trickles all the way down. And so it makes sense. This person's having a lateral MI. And again, here's the lesion knocking out all this area. Now, I like this EKG. It's pretty hard to pick up on a septal MI. 
but I'll tell you, I, I made, I had this whole theory going. I, I would applied this theory for years working in the inpatient side of cardiology. And I saw the CKG and it, and it wasn't read as an MI. And I was beside myself because I said to myself, you know, oh my gosh, the Goldstein theory just got killed. And then I went into the cath report and I saw that they had a, a, a septal lesion. And so my theory held true. So I'm really excited about the CKG. I'm more excited, of course, if the patient went to the cath lab and got reperfused. But uh, for, for my selfish purposes, this helped me mentally for a long time. But let's look at that and say, is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? Yes. Inferiorly, it looks okay. I mean, you could, you could, for fun, say I have some flattening of T waves. High lateral wall, looks okay. Septum. I'm not liking that look. I don't like the hammock. I don't like the appearance here of the ST segment elevation. Again, V1 is really complex to look at because you usually see pretty much nothing up on top. And then I have septal, I mean, the anteriorly looks okay and low lateral wall looks okay. So do I have a problem? I'm thinking yes. You really usually don't have reciprocal changes with septum. A pure septal MI, the person really has to have a, an anatomy that's pretty specialized. But I can make it up and say that they have reciprocal changes and it's focal. And I can say to myself, okay, can this happen? Yes, you could have a little anatomical branch, so to speak, of the LAD and sort of the anterior still is getting fed, but the septum's not. So again, it's pretty, it's pretty rare, the CKG, but it could happen. And again, you would have to have specialized anatomy to knock off that, that one specific area and spare the kind of like the whole LED area, the anterior. Usually they come together because you can see anatomically where the lesion would be. Okay, so now here's the next deal. You could have mixed because you could have a proximal lesion that still makes sense anatomically. So let's look at this one, and then I'm going to ask you, how does this make sense anatomically? I sort of, I sort of started to give it away earlier, uh, but we'll talk about it because I sort of held this close to myself for years and was always chicken to ask one of the cardiologists. And then finally, I said, "That's it. I got to know this," and 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 I asked. But let's let's just look at the CKG. So, is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? And I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to break it down into neighborhoods. I'm going to say okay. Inferiorly, do I have any concerns? And I see some big time ST segment elevation and it doesn't look like a water slide. So I'm already feeling the beach and I'm concerned. And then high lateral wall, I see some scooping look of ischemia. And then septally, I'm seeing the same scooping type of ischemia. And then Anteriorly, maybe a flattening, nothing too exciting. And low lateral wall, I'm seeing ST segment elevation. So I say to myself, is it global or focal? And I know that it's focal because I had an opposite reciprocal change in the opposite area. And I ask myself, does it make sense anatomically? And on the surface, I would say no right? One's the right side of the heart and one's the left side of the heart. And it always bugged me, but I sort of just played along and like, oh, okay, they're having an infralateral, even it made absolutely no sense to me. But then here's the deal. Look up here at this, at this person's anatomy. You can actually have a very long RCA branch that not only does the feeding the inferior, but wraps up to the low lateral wall. So an infralateral MI actually makes sense anatomically. 2-3 AVF and V5-V6 because of this person's anatomy. And it's actually a very common anatomy. So it's something that's very common to see. So it's sort of like we start getting into these mixed bags of MIs, an infralateral MI. And again, it makes sense anatomically. And again, you can see closer here what that anatomy is like. 
that could cause this to happen. And then we could have more mixes. So you could have, usually it's a bifurcation lesion because if they have a left main go down, then you're, you're probably not seeing them in the, uh, in the EKG world. You're probably seeing them with a Lucas on and uh, you're probably seeing them not do very well when they get to the ER, if they even get there. But you can have like a bifurcation lesion, sort of where the LED and the circumflex flex branch off. So again, is the rhythm okay? Is the rate okay? And I'm going to say yes. And then I break it into neighborhoods. I say inferiorly, what do I have? I have deep ischemic appearance. And then I say, okay, high lateral wall. I have ST segment elevation and it's not a water slide. And then I say septally, I don't like that appearance. It's more like a surfboard. And again, I have some stuff coming up here, but whatever. Anteriorly, I don't like it either. I have some big time ST segment elevation. And then low lateral wall, big time ST segment elevation. So again, generally I'm like, oh boy, this isn't good. But is it global or focal? It's actually focal because I don't have the same problem over here. And so I have reciprocal changes to support my theory that it's focal. And then I'm gonna say, does this make sense anatomically? Well, yeah. If I block off where the RC, where, if I block off where the LED and the circumflex bifurcate, you've heard them say someone had kissing stents or they had a bifurcation lesion. That's because it's right there. It's not, it's not, again, it's not that their left mean goes down. And so we have this gets knocked out and this gets knocked out. So an anterolateral, and you, you don't, even though you're saying, well, what about septal? You just don't call it an anteroseptolateral. You just call it an anteroseptal MI. And so I can see where I have my problems and it makes sense. And it's like the beach. Now you'll hear, again, you'll hear people say, oh, that's a fireman's helmet, that's a tombstone. Okay, yeah, that's kind of stuff that people have talked about for many, many years. And that's how they taught me, you know, back when I took paramedic in uh, in, in the late 80s or early 90s. But the, the key thing is that those only satisfy two shapes. So that's why I would suggest, yeah, you could throw that into your, into your your little your little glossary of terms but i like the beach theme because it covers everything and also ties in the water slide now you could have more mixes oh actually this is the one i showed you just now so this is the anterolateral so the, the lesions right there a bifurcation lesion which knocks out this knocks out this and we end up having all this territory knocked out. And that's why you'll hear, look how much territory that is. So I always laugh when people ask me, you know, when, when someone, when someone dies, you know, or that they live and someone's like, oh, is, was that the widow maker? And I'm thinking, well, if they had a spouse, then it was the widow maker. I mean, like, I never understood what the difference was. People tend to think that this is really bad when there's an LED lesion. Um, you know, it is bad, but uh, it's definitely savable. But the more proximal you go on any of these lesions, the more area of distribution it gets knocked out. Okay, and then we have another one and then we're gonna talk about sort of a, a different area. So is the rhythm okay, is the rate okay? And we say, yeah. And then we say inferior, am I concerned? Yes, I have some ischemia. And high lateral wall looks okay. And septum, well, I see some ST segment elevation ish appearance, but it's like a water slide, right? And same in anteriorly, it's like a water slide. Oh, but now low lateral wall, I pull this in as the beach. And so now I'm concerned because I've drawn that other side of the boardwalk into my picture and I am seeing a greater a, a greater problem that's all at the beach. And so is it global or focal? It's it's focal. 
right? Because I don't see that same problem here. And I ask myself, okay, do is the problem, do, do I have reciprocal changes to support my theory? And the answer is yes. And then anatomically, can this happen? And yes, I've spared the circumflex, but I have a, a pretty high up LED lesion. And so you can see how a lot of problems could happen from that, right? Because what runs through this area of the heart? Well, first of all, I have the whole left ventricle. I have the big primary conduction issues going on right there. So that could be a problem, right? So if V1 through V6 is an LED occlusion, so I knocked out that whole area here. And again, you can see where that would happen anatomically. Okay, so now here's here's one that people sometimes miss. And you know, you learned in ACLS and, and you know in the protocols, you don't want to be giving nitro to someone who's having a posterior MI. And so this is where it really does make a difference um, reading the EKG in the field and making a determination what medication you're going to give the person. So if the person is knocking out the right side of their heart, the bottom of their heart, the back of their heart, and sort of the wall that goes over to the left side of the heart, they got they don't got a whole lot more they're working on to pump. And so working off of the pump. And so if the we want to be able to pick up on posterior type of MIs. Now, basically, I want you to think about it like this. When I have a RCA lesion that that branch of the RCA that fed the inferior area has the problem in it, just that branch, it's isolated to the inferior area of the heart. But now imagine if it's more proximal and it's knocking out that bottom part, that inferior area, but also knocking out the whole back of the heart. So I have a more proximal RCA lesion. We have to look at this. And I'm not, I'm not gonna make fun of right-sided EKGs. Uh, you know, they, they could be helpful, they're, they're time consuming. I personally don't have a, a need usually to, to do one. Uh, you know, generally in the, in the hospital, when was the last time you, you saw them do a right-sided EKG? You can really glean the information you want. Yes, you could confirm it with some fancy, fun stuff, but you could glean emergently what you want to glean out of the EKG, just the standard 12 lead EKG that you do. And so if I look at this EKG, notice how inferiorly I'm concerned because I have SC segment elevation inferiorly. And so I know that the RCA at some point has a problem. But now I want you to think about is this. What part, look at your kind of, think on your chest for a minute, where V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 go, right? Think about where they go. And then think about what three leads on the front of your chest are most anterior to the posterior. In other words, if I was going to sort of look at your chest and I was going to sort of use some kind of a infrared thing to look through you and I want to look at the back of your heart, where am I going to look? And so I would suggest that I would look in the V1, V2, V3 area because that is most anterior to your posterior. And so I would expect to see if I'm sort of, imagine if I did a posterior EKG, if I put all the leads on your back and you'll see different things online about people putting leads on the back to get the posterior look and they put the three leads underneath the scapula area. What are they essentially doing? They're looking at the posterior just like you're looking at the anterior. But if I'm gonna look all the way through, I'm gonna see 
sort of the opposite appearance. If I'm looking through a healthy anterior and I'm sort of seeing sort of the mirrored back view of the posterior when I stare all the way through your chest wall. And so I'm sort of seeing an inverted MI, so to speak, in the posterior area. And that's why if you see SC segment depression, V1, V2, V3, that's suspicious that the person's having a posterior MI. You could have that in its own right, because think about it. I could spare that branch that's heading to the inferior and just beyond it. I could have a posterior event going on, which only affects the posterior, but that's very rare. That's very rare. Something I saw was like 10% of, of inferior, 10% of posterior MIs are isolated posterior. So very, very rare, you probably won't see it. And if you see it, you probably miss it because the next thing that article said is that people generally miss it. So, but if you only see this, be concerned. If you see this inferior MI together with V1, V2, V3, SC segment de depression, you want to be thinking this person's having a posterior event and you don't want to be giving them nitro. Now, here's another one. There's another, here, here's another one of the same. Now, I see this SC segment elevation. Actually, this one, this one I put up here to show you something a little bit different. I see SC segment elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. And again, it's a little bit subtle. You gotta, you gotta, gotta look carefully and start, start developing that sort of that shape that you see in, in your, with your eyes as far as this SC segment elevation and sort of that hammock type of appearance. And so I have SC segment elevation, 2, 3, and AVF. And then here I don't see SC segment depression, V1 through V3, but there's another criteria. I see SC segment depression in V2, and I see a prominent R wave in one and two. I should have put V1 and V2 here. Do you see how I see an R wave here? Usually you see very, very little right here. But here I do see an R wave. And here I see a very prominent R wave for V2. Usually you see very, very little in V1 next to nothing. You see a little bleep in V2. And then you start having R wave progression. And then it starts coming down again as you head to V6. So if you see SC segment elevation, V1, V2, V3, I'm sorry, V2, V3, V3 I'm sorry, lead two, three, and AVF, and you see SC segment depression V2 and an R wave that's a little more prominent in V1 and V2, that's also a posterior event. So you can have two different posteriors. You can have a posterior of SC segment depression V1, V2, V3, usually associated with your MI in the inferior area, or you could have SC segment depression in V2 with an R wave in V1 and V2. And so that's another finding of a posterior MI. And it's it's really good not to miss that because you can bottom the person out if you give them nitro. So I think we've I think we've hit our time. If you have one more minute, um, I can bring this up next time, this AVR. But I just want to present one case if you have one more minute, and then we'll call it a night. Um, because it's interesting, it just, it really shows you how an EKG is a snapshot in time. And this is a patient that I had, it was 80, 89 year old female. She had four hours of constant central chest pain. She attributed to GERD, no cardiac history. After four hours, her family called because they were like, okay, this is different than her normal GERD. And this was her initial EKG. And I'll let you take a look at it for a minute.
So I'm looking at ZKG and I'm saying, do I have any concerns over Rizzo's K rate's okay? Uh, yes, I'm 100% on board that she's got something weird looking right here, but it's pretty isolated. I don't see the, the problem in the whole neighborhood. I do feel I have some ischemia here. The rest of it, maybe some ischemia there, but I, I don't I don't have anything to hang my hat on that, I, that I'm going to STEMI alert this person necessarily. You can argue, but that's kind of where I was going with the ZKG. Started an IV, gave her two baby aspirin to complement the two that she took at seven o'clock, gave her a bunch of nitro, and I headed on to the hospital. The closest hospital was on red and yellow. So I was going one hospital over, and everything was nice and happy. I did a follow up EKG shortly after, you know, and then I said, you know, this is getting a little more concerning over here but I'm still not feeling it, right? Because like I got one issue going on, one place, and, and I always taught myself if the person is just having one focal problem, then, you know, micro focal, we'll call it. It's not a, it's not a STEMI. So I'm, I'm going with that and, and, and we're driving down the road. No, no change after the nitro. And this is where getting successive EKGs is, is a really good idea. Because then I'm in the middle of transport for giggles, I hit the EKG machine again. And we're about 10 minutes in from the first EKG. So got her out of the house, got the first EKG in the house, gave her some treatment, got her outside right before we left to go outside, did the second EKG. Now I'm outside. We're driving through the neighborhood. We're on our way to the hospital and bam, full blown STEMI. You could even argue that it's starting to get ugly posteriorly. Uh, right? So here I could have said, well, you know, it's not a STEMI and just called it in at that. Uh, turned out we rerouted because we hadn't passed the red and yellow hospital yet. And so I just got on the radio. And I said, hey, one minute out with a STEMI, blah, 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 done, pulled in, and she went right to the cath lab. Um, but it just, it just kind of, you know, EK, it just sort of showed that in EKG, it's a snapshot in time. I mean, in those 10 minutes, we went from a, I'm not going to say a normal EKG by any, by any, you know, stretch of the imagination. But clearly, it wasn't a full-blown STEMI, but it just evolved. Nothing changed with her except for, bam, she had she STEMI'd out, so to speak. So anyhow, uh, so that's what I have for tonight. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, hopefully we'll jump on together next time, and we'll get more into what mimics an MI now that we have the foundation of what an MI looks like. That was awesome. I love this approach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions from you guys? I actually put in the chat uh, the link for the sign-in. Ashley, if you could post that again. Just a bunch of thank yous coming in. All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys. Everyone have a great night. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the good weather. Thanks, Matt. And we'll see appreciate you in a couple weeks. Awesome. Take care. Thanks, sir. Hey, you guys, if you have any issues with your um, sign-in, we need to resolve that now. So please feel free to ch check the link. If you have any problems um, completing that, let me know. If you have any questions.